I would like to really make that clear that I'm far from claiming they are to be blamed for it. The people who are to be blamed for their success with pork use as it has gone uh, developed in the last 20 years in this country are really primarily the medical establishment again more than the truck users including the gay men because they fail to warn people what the health cancer the medical consequences are of long-term truck use on the contrary they in fact promote it to some way in some way by handing out clean needles and encouraging people to use clean needles and they encourage them to use drugs so I'm not blaming the users as they often you know, well, pigeonhole me and say you're a homophobe or you're against junkies or against your anti-libertarian and all this. So AIDS was transformed from a drug problem to a disease and it up big time. With a generous supply of taxpayers' dollars, the Centers for Disease Control could reinvest in HIV and that's just what they did. Grants and support from the government, along with tax-deductible gifts from the private sector, became available to any organization supporting HIV. And right behind the CDC came the pharmaceutical industry. Glaxo Welcome and Bristol Myers Squibb have provided hundreds of thousands of dollars to AIDS organizations to promote seminars on the benefits of using their drugs. Soon, even rebels like Martin Delaney, who were at one time critical of the use of AZT, reversed their position 180 degrees after receiving contributions from the pharmaceutical giants. Act up, fight back, fight AIDS. These leaders of the AIDS organizations are often seen at extravagant AIDS benefits with politicians and film stars who raise millions of tax-deductible dollars for the AIDS establishment. AIDS organizations have also become very active in the battle for gay rights because this appeals to homosexuals who join the group effort. That's because HIV provides gays with AIDS a scapegoat, a way out of accepting personal responsibility for their condition. This illusion is exploited by the AIDS establishment through their AIDS organizations who equate the war against AIDS with the struggle for gay rights. Through boycotts, newspaper editorials, and the mass media, AIDS organization leaders shift the blame for AIDS onto the straight community who aren't doing enough and somehow responsible for HIV taking thousands of lives. The fig leaf egalitarian philosophy behind HIV has become a political giant. Regardless of how one feels about gay rights, you have to wonder why money being spent to fight a disease goes to promoting the behavior so closely associated with the cause of that very disease. Are they really for gay rights, or are they using this to cultivate more AIDS patients? And as gays philosophically identify with the war against HIV, it becomes a politically correct means to their own self-destruction. Anyone who opposes the HIV mindset is labeled uncompassionate, homophobic, and a social menace. Even gay activists like Michael Callan and Sean Current, who have denounced HIV and treatments like AZT, soon find themselves ostracized by other homosexuals. The conservative right is also part of the plan. The CDC and the AIDS establishment have buttered both sides of the bread politically and support churches, community health centers, doctors and schools with HIV disinformation and in some cases government funding. One group in particular, Americans for a Sound AIDS Policy, is lobbying for mandatory HIV testing. But scientists remain the most important group to control. Because money for research is handled by the National Institutes of Health, anyone who dares to challenge the HIV hypothesis risks losing their funding. Dr. Peter Duesberg was given the Outstanding Investigator Grant, the NIH's most prestigious award. But when he began presenting arguments against HIV, his funding was terminated. Yes, I had for 28 years, I had government cancer to research, and I lost them all since I questioned the HIV hypothesis. I, for one, have tried in the last two or three years, desperately, I've written 18 grant applications to study the effects of recreational drugs on cells in culture, on animals, or even on humans, if this were possible. Every one of these applications has been turned down. And if you, there's not one single study funded by the National Institute of Health or by the Department of Health and Human Studies, I say not one, not even uno, that studies the long-term effect of these drugs on, the, on health. The amount of funding going into HIV AIDS research is tremendously disproportional to the masses afflicted with other diseases. 
AIDS patients get $15 of government funding for every $1 spent on patients with cancer, heart disease, or MS. So the resources and scientific research used in HIV AIDS diverts our efforts from other diseases that afflict larger groups of the population. In this way, HIV and AIDS are killing us all. In order to justify the need for this enormous amount of money, the AIDS industry must continually perpetuate the terror of a mass epidemic while making announcements about breakthroughs in research and new drug treatments. Yet the answer, they say, is still years away. To keep the AIDS threat alive, the CDC has used statistical sleight of hand. For example, they keep adding diseases to the AIDS disease list. Naturally, as diseases are added to the list, AIDS cases increase. If the CDC wanted to make it appear that AIDS was going away, all they need to do is subtract diseases from the list. But, as critics state, that would be bad for business. Yet in spite of all they've done to juggle figures to fit their projections, new AIDS cases continue to decline. Only one out of 10 AIDS patients are female, a number that is embarrassingly low for a disease that is said to be spread sexually. So they added cervical cancer, and by the new definition, having less than 200 T cells in HIV antibody, overnight thousands of women became new AIDS patients, and the CDC played it up big with announcements that women are now the fastest growing group of new AIDS cases. For over 12 years now, HIV proponents are still trying to explain exactly how HIV causes AIDS and why in other cases it doesn't. Rather than admit HIV might not be the cause of AIDS, they've gone way on a limb with far-fetched explanations. For example, the reason why Africans are not getting AIDS is because HIV has two strains, HIV-1, which causes AIDS quickly among Americans, and HIV-2, which is weaker and not causing AIDS in Africa. Duesberg argues they are both weak and neither one are doing anything. Another explanation that was proposed was that HIV could be found in the lymph nodes and then migrated to reinfect the body. But this explanation was abandoned even by HIV proponents when it was discovered that the amount of active virus in the lymph nodes was too small and insignificant to generate a reinfection. The most recent attempt to explain HIV's long latent period and how the virus eventually causes AIDS was based on the viral load hypothesis by Zapier Wei and David Ho. They claimed that HIV slowly wears down the immunity and causes a civil war where the immune system turns on itself. But their procedure of detecting HIV was through a DNA process called quantitative PCR that cannot validate if the virus is active and their calculations are inconsistent with other valid tests measuring active HIV. In the reappraising AIDS newsletter, mathematician Dr. Mark Craddock uses a time infection rate disease formula to prove that David Ho's viral load hypothesis is mathematically impossible. It's, it's a, desperate, a desperate effort to hold on to HIV. You see, uh, they're endowing HIV with unusual, perhaps even supernatural powers of mutating to evade, hiding in the lymph nodes, doing something else crazy. It's got to, we've, they've got to hold on to HIV. Why? To hold on to their funding. Anthony Fauci and the AIDS establishment put out a continual barrage of information about how HIV is thriving in the system and causing AIDS. This fools the public, but it does not change the facts. And the hard fact is, HIV does not work in the real-life population studies. It can't go on forever. A lot of us uh, are beginning to see now that uh, the handwriting's on the wall with HIV. It's, it's very difficult uh, uh, for the proponents of the HIV theory to, uh, to persist in the face of, uh, of weekly or monthly uh, evidence to the contrary. For several years, Dr. Richard Stroman has predicted that the AIDS establishment would use a face-saving diversion called cofactors to explain HIV shortcomings. A cofactor is another virus or health problem that works in conjunction with HIV. Many of the HIV advocates are now admitting HIV needs a helper. But Duesberg points out that there is no single cofactor upon which everyone agrees. Even Robert Gallo, who for years had argued that HIV itself was sufficient alone to cause AIDS. Now he has a cofactor, human herpes virus 6, a virus that infects about 85% of the entire population without causing diseases. The question is, 
Will Gallo's herpes virus become a consensus cofactor? I doubt it. I think it's just the cofactor of the months or the two months of, until the next one comes along. I've seen so many. The whole thing is not an infectious disease, and with another infectious virus, you don't, you don't get around that.